so welcome back to the Learn at Home series. Um, participants will be muted upon entry. And following the presentation, you have the opportunity to ask questions or you can type questions into the chat as we go. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bay Wu, who's the Vice Dean for Research and Dean's Professor in Global Health at NYU uh, College of Nursing. She's the co-founder of the NYU Aging Incubator. She's currently leading several NIH-funded projects, including clinical trial to improve oral health for persons with cognitive impairment. Uh, she co-leads the Rutgers NYU Center for Asian Health Promotion and Equity. Through the center, she leads a five-year intervention study that focuses on supporting Chinese and Korean dementia caregivers. Dr. Wu is a PI on the NIA-funded Asian Resource Center for Minority Aging. Her extensive publications cover a wide range of topics, including risk factors related to cognitive impairment, dementia, caregiving, and geriatric oral health. She's a fellow of the Gerontological Society of America and the New York Academy of Medicine. She is also an honorary fellow of the American Academy of Nursing, and she'll present on brain aging and oral health. Um, at the end of the seminar, a pop-up will uh, you'll see a pop-up um, to with a like very brief survey to help us um, gauge how the learn at homes are going. So take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Zina, uh, for the introduction and thank you for attending this uh, seminar. So today uh, my talk is on uh, brain aging and, and the oral health. Uh, this is uh, the area of research that I our team has been uh, uh, studying for the past uh, um, close to two, two decades. Um, so dementia uh, that uh, for, I'm sure that uh, we all know this is a, a, a global challenge that I just want to give you um, again some statistics uh, for your information that um, on, uh, in 2015, uh, was the estimate of uh, persons with dementia uh, was around 44 million uh, individuals. Uh, but by uh, 2050, this uh, this number is uh, probably will reach to 152 million uh, uh, individuals globally. So certainly, this is uh, uh, quite a challenge as our population. Uh, is aging, this number of uh, persons with dementia will uh, certainly will increase. That, uh, again, think about uh, the most of this, 60% uh, the, the of uh, dementia cases, uh, most likely uh, to be in low and middle income countries. Um, that, but also uh, that the, the, care, the cost of care uh, for persons with dementia uh, will grow exponentially just based on uh, some estimate um, just uh, uh, that globally care for persons with dementia was the cost was uh, 1 trillion in 2018, but it will uh, actually um, be uh, in 2030, the, the, the cost will uh, doubled. So that is uh, a very, um, high number and uh, uh, it's a, it's persons with dementia uh, has such a number increases uh, a, a lot. But also that is, uh, looking at the leading cause, the 10 leading causes of death in the United States, Alzheimer's disease, which is the most common type of dementia is the only cause of death that uh, uh, without any effective way to prevent, cure, or significant slow of its progression. So uh, between 2000 and 2017, the, percent, the percentage of deaths in other conditions, such as heart disease, stroke, and, and HIV, uh, the percent, uh, percentage of deaths uh, decreased. In the meantime, uh, the deaths in Alzheimer's disease actually increased, increased to uh, increase 145%. So currently we still don't have the magic pill to, to treat the, this disease. That's why I think about prevention as well as uh, how to provide the care for persons with dementia becomes very, very important. So this is also um, something that uh, that's the focus of this, uh, this talk 
think about um, prevention as well as caring for persons uh, with dementia. Um, so this is a figure probably uh, is known for, for many of you. This is a, a Lancet report that published in 2020. Lancet report of the, the commission, Lancet commission suggests that 12 potentially modifiable risk factors accounted for around 40% of dementia worldwide. So as you can see, essentially the, that uh, from the uh, early life in terms of education, the level of education to mid midlife, think about uh, hearing loss, uh, traumatic brain injuries, hypertension, alcohol, and obesity. These are kind of midlife, uh, these kind of factors, uh, risk factors, as well as late life. Look at smoking, depression, social isolation, and physical inactivity, air pollution, diabetes. So here that the diabetes uh, based on estimate account for 1%, 1% increase, increase risk for dementia. The reason I mentioned this is because uh, in the next few slides, I will particularly kind of discuss the, the, the impact of diabetes as well as oral health as a risk, risk factor for cognitive, um, cognitive decline. So um, overall, there's certainly there's uh, uh, still 60% unknown risk factors that we, we need to further uh, study. So here, um, now I'm going to introduce oral health, why we uh, have been kind of studying oral health for, for a number of years. Certainly oral health related diseases and the conditions are uh, understudied in the field of uh, geriatrics and the gerontology. Uh, oral health uh, uh, the, uh, is an essential element, uh, is essential element of healthy aging, uh, increased evidence, and particularly more recently, increasing evidence show, shows that oral health uh, is associated with uh, brain health. So in oral health, uh, the, the poor oral health is, uh, is uh, one of the most common chronic conditions so, uh, among adult population, that, uh, but it's also uh, often neglected problem in older adults. So among older adults in the United States, um, there's a 20% of the older adults had untreated cavities and the 20% had uh, edentulism, which is complete tooth loss. And also 68% of older adults in the nation had gum diseases, which is a periodontitis. So, and for many of us also are very interested in addressing um, health disparities and the promote uh, equity in our studies. And so we also study oral health disparities. And I think oral health disparities reflect most challenging uh, issues um, facing in the United States because the dental um, insurance is very much kind of, there's no universal dental insurance for older adults. Well, Medicare so far actually, to some extent, is almost like a universal coverage for older adults, but dental insurance is not. There's no universal dental insurance in the United States. And most of the, it's all basically employer sponsored uh, dental insurance. So most of uh, dental cost uh, that can be out of pocket for many older adults. So this certainly think about access to dental care is, uh, is one of the major challenges of facing older adults. And also this is something very much reflect that what that the overall challenges in, in the United States think about access to care issue. So um, there's some uh, is it also increasing evidence to suggest there's a kind of association between oral health and system systemic diseases, that there's a uh, oral health in, is a, uh, associated with cardiovascular diseases, oral health associated with diabetes, that our group has also looked into quite a bit, look at the oral health and tooth loss in relationship with diabetes as well. 
and oral health related to respiratory uh, diseases, uh, related to stroke, related to osteoporosis, as well as uh, related to uh, de uh, depressive symptoms. We also have a few publications looking into that as well, that uh, chronic depressive symptoms are essentially related to, to oral health problems um, and conditions. Most of these kind of studies are based on observational studies or epidemiological studies. And, uh, and the effects may be bi-directional when you look at these uh, conditions. So um, we uh, just uh, this year, early this year, we published the, the article, look at the social, social isolation among old adults that linked to uh, having fewer teeth. We look at uh, actually the longitudinal data uh, in, in China and look at uh, uh, how this uh, uh, social isolation, uh, the, the issue of social, social isolation or house. The reason that we um, that looked uh, into this area of research because of social isolation, particularly during COVID, is a, such a prominent issue uh, in the nation and globally. And certainly COVID-19 has exacerbated the problem of social isolation among all the adults that even prior to COVID, that already that um, based on the, the report from National Academy of Medicine, uh, white paper suggests that 25% of older adults were socially isolated even prior to COVID. So this, uh, during COVID, this issue it becomes uh, very significant. So we can, uh, conducted this study and found that uh, older adults who were socially isolated had on average 2.1 fewer natural teeth and 1.4 times the, the rate of losing their teeth than those with uh, stronger social ties. So, um, and the social, we also found that socially isolated old adults tend to be less engaged in social and health promoting behaviors like physical activity that which could have a negative impact on their overall functioning and oral hygiene, as well as increased risk for systemic inflammation. This paper actually interestingly uh, becomes one of the most cited and one most kind of recognized top 10 uh, articles uh, for, for this journal that uh, retrieving back to 20 years ago overall. So it's, it's quite interesting just think about that, uh, that society's uh, uh, attention and interest in, uh, in this area, think about social isolation and the uh, health outcomes. Um, tooth loss, disability, and, and the mortality that uh, based on our uh, study, as well as uh, the study from Europe, found that tooth loss is strongly and, and independently associated with onset of disability and the mortality in all the adults. That we think that tooth loss may be an early indicator of accelerated aging. However, the direction of causality um, is unclear. So this is something that in uh, my uh, kind of summary statement later on, we'll particularly say what we do know and what we don't know in terms of uh, brain aging and, uh, and oral health. So, and uh, that recently we conducted a study, look at a longitudinal study of oral health, dental care and the cognitive function. As I mentioned earlier, Dental care, dental insurance is, is very much employer sponsored, and we don't have a universal dental insurance for all the adults. So, how this kind of uh, intersections uh, across oral health, dental care, and the cognitive uh, decline is a play uh, in, uh, among all the adults in the nation. We use national uh, national study uh, survey, look at uh, the uh, health and retirement study which is the most uh, commonly used data set in the nation to study uh, health-related outcomes among all the adults, uh, health retirement study, and look at uh, uh, exam the longitudinal association between these, um, uh, these factors. So um, here is the figure that uh, we uh, that from this figure, we can see that these are the kind of four, four groups. This is a dentate, um, here is um, uh, this two 
a kind of mixed here that uh, dentate never visited a uh, visit a dentist and also that uh, here this society edentism which is complete tooth loss and never had any uh, dental visit this is a line this is a cognitive function overall that as the using ticks uh, that a telephone interview of cognitive um, uh, assessment uh, scale um, and this is actually 10 years over 10 year period that uh, uh, from 2006 to 2016. So this is the, uh, then you look at this line is for individuals who have a dentate, which means have some uh, natural teeth as well as actually have a biannual uh, dental visit, regular dental visit. So clearly you can see that this is the same individuals that follow over 10 year period. So for those individuals who have some uh, level of um, natural teeth, retained natural teeth, as well as a biannual dental visit, and they are actually cognitive function that uh, uh, has the slowest rate of cognitive decline uh, for these individuals. Now we know that uh, overall, as people get older, these are talking about older adults, as people get older, that their cognitive level of cognitive function declines. So, but you look at this line certainly showing that for these individuals, they have a slowest rate of cognitive decline versus those individuals who never visit a dentist and had a complete tooth loss that, um, in this. So the effect here that the, the, this figure shows that the effect of dental visit actually are uh, stronger protective factors against cognitive uh, decline than being dented dented at baseline. Uh, relatedly, in the three-way, this, this is basically three-way three interaction models here that I'm presenting. That the results uh, suggest that both dental visits and being dented are not uh, really comp complementary, but both necessary conditions for a slow decline in cognitive function, as you can see from, from this, uh, this line here. So, um, so overall, that the finding uh, suggests uh, that the dental, the importance of dental visit, and the also importance of uh, retaining natural uh, natural teeth. So, um, last year we published a systematic review and the meta analysis articles uh, paper that particularly look at uh, tooth loss, how this uh, tooth loss associate with increased cognitive impairment and onset of dementia. And also look at the dosage effect, look at the how actually number of tooth loss, how this is related to cognitive impairment and the dementia. So, and we found that older adults with more tooth loss had 1.48 times higher risk of developing cognitive impairment and 1.28 times higher risk of being diagnosed uh, with dementia, even after controlling for uh, many confounding factors. And each additional, so this is also the dosage effect, look at the, the meta analysis based on meta analysis. So each additional missing tooth was associated with 1.4% increased risk uh, of a cognitive impairment and 1.1% increased risk of being diagnosed with, uh, with dementia. So certainly that the evidence uh, 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 is quite strong look at the linkages between oral health and, uh, and the cognitive uh, decline as well as the dementia. So this article actually was uh, NIA uh, was very interesting, this article, and they uh, wrote a featured report search and put on their website, NIA website, that same tooth loss in older, uh, in older adults linked to higher risk of, uh, of dementia. And there also there's many uh, national, international media outlets also reported this finding. So that's um, kind of think about more attention has been paid to look at oral health in relationship with uh, uh, cognitive impairment and dementia. So we also uh, looked at using English longitudinal study of aging, uh, this is from UK, 
as well as uh, China uh, Health and Retirement Study, which is sister's uh, data from uh, with a Health and Retirement Study in the United States. Look at using these two studies, lo look at uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, international populations, the Chinese and, uh, and old adult in England. And uh, we tested this bi-directional relationships between cognitive function and oral health. And found that certainly that some bi-directional relationship exists uh, for these uh, populations. These are all national longitudinal studies. Uh, so uh, then we actually start to dive into look at the co-occurrence of diabetes and the poor oral health. Because from this one figure that I showed you earlier uh, from the Lancet Commission report, that diabetes already actually identified as one, uh, one of the 12 common risk factors that account for 1% um, of the increased risk of, uh, of dementia. But certainly oral health, poor oral health is not a part of this uh, kind of uh, identified common uh, factors. So our team is trying to provide more uh, uh, evidence to, to support this and consider this poor oral health is also a common um, risk factor of cognitive decline. So that uh, again, there's a growing evidence to suggest uh, showing the association between poor oral health and the diminished cognitive function and the potential pathways linking uh, ADRD, Alzheimer's disease and related dementia onset with uh, diabetes and the tooth loss, uh, include inflammation and poor nutrition uh, uptake. So we, we have actually quite, uh, published uh, several articles and this particular article is currently under review, look at the trajectory of cognitive, uh, uh, cognitive decline among old adults. So here is our conceptual framework. Think about what are the kind of underlying mechanisms for the association that across poor oral health, diabetes, and uh, uh, ADRD, and the cognitive decline. So if you look at this uh, periodontal, periodontal uh, conditions, as well as the tooth loss, that, uh, that uh, if you have a long-term chronic uh, uh, periodontal uh, conditions, that the ultimate result actually is outcome is tooth loss. So that's what tooth loss is ultimate kind of outcomes for periodontitis. And here's diabetes. So if we look at uh, periodontal conditions in relationship to ADRD, cognitive function, one pathway um, is, uh, uh, is look at the bacteria uh, uh, dysbiosis. So this uh, finding uh, was uh, published uh, uh, in uh, science that suggests this is uh, uh, some relationships there, but also that look at the common pathways between oral health and diabetes. These are kind of uh, think about chronic inflammations, cardiovascular diseases, and the stroke on that, as well as actually dietary intakes, diabetes and the tooth loss impact, dietary intake and the nutrition. This is a potentially uh, common kind of pathways to ADID and the cognitive decline. Uh, in terms of particular uh, pathways for tooth loss can be uh, somewhat uh, uh, interocclusal uh, contacts and the somatic sensory input can potentially relate to ADID and the cognitive function. There's a few articles coming up and particularly from Japan, Japanese researchers has found, has done quite a few, uh, published a few studies to look at uh, this interocclusal context, chewing abilities looking at uh, related to ADRD and the cognitive uh, decline. So overall that uh, uh, here we again uh, trying to uh, that, uh, uh, present one article that is a currently manuscripts currently is under review. Look at the co-occurrence of uh, uh, diabetes and the edentialism, which is a complete tooth loss, contribute to accelerated cognitive decline among older adults. Then we have a second hypothesis: is the impact of a co-occurrence of diabetes and the tooth loss on cognitive decline varies across 
uh, age groups. Even among old adults, there's uh, some kind of uh, differences in terms of the different age groups, uh, old adults. So uh, the, the currently current finding characterizing relationship with di di diabetes and the, uh, cognitive uh, uh, decline are inconsistent across studies of different age groups an insignificant relationship between diabetes and the cognitive decline is often detected in, in the oldest old, you know, which is age 85 and above. So in this study, we want to look at actually how this is different, uh, look at the oral health impact as well across different age groups. So uh, data, again, we use health and retirement studies. Uh, this is uh, uh, every two years, they collect data for the same individuals and national representative survey of old adults in the US. Um, we break down this, uh, uh, among those, uh, we break down this age cohorts on this, uh, we call young old, which is uh, 65 to 74. The middle old is 75 to 84 and the oldest old, which is uh, uh, 85 years and above. So look at the three different age groups and how this co-occurrence of diabetes and uh, uh, complete tooth loss impact on cognitive decline and uh, uh, cognitive decline here. So uh, this is a TICS. This is a TICS is a modified the telephone interview cognitive status. It's a, a, a dementia and eventually those are all self-reported in 2006. Then we a cognitive function was measured in each wave every two years from 2006 to 2016 for each eligible respondent. So here we found that uh, this is a statistical uh, measures that I look at for each age groups, linear mixed effect regression model was um, uh, was used to estimate person's trajectory of cognitive function. Uh, that I'm not going to the detail to explain this uh, statistical method here. Uh, here is a decline rate of exposure status. Exposure status here is uh, that whether individuals uh, a reference group is for for respondents that don't have diabetes and have some level of uh, uh, natural teeth. But here it says that uh, other three other exposure groups is uh, uh, diabetes only for those individuals that have diabetes only, but have uh, that has some level of natural teeth, but also just for those who lost all their teeth uh, only, but um, don't have diabetes. But here has both for individuals has both diabetes and, and the complete tooth loss. So when you look at this, this is the kind of exposure um, uh, interact with time. So that means that the, the, to, to look at the, the decline rate of cognitive function. So certainly if you look at those age, uh, young older adults group that you can see that uh, 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 diabetes has uh, for individuals with diabetes only um, compared to those who don't have these uh, conditions, they have a, a more uh, rapid decline of cognitive function. This is pretty obvious. But look at the edentialism only, complete tooth loss. That is also has a, a significantly a faster decline of cognitive function. And uh, interestingly, if we look at the coefficient, actually coefficients are higher than those with diabetes only. For the complete tooth loss only, has a, has a stronger effect than diabetes. So edentialism, complete tooth loss has a stronger effect than diabetes uh, for the impact on the rate of cognitive decline from here. So uh, that, that both that uh, for the individuals with both diabetes and uh, edentialism that even have a more uh, significant decline rate of uh, uh, cognitive function and the coefficient is uh, higher than both two. So it certainly has some uh, additive effect of for those individuals has both diabetes and uh, edentialism. But if you look at the age, uh, middle old age, which are considered 75 to 84 years old, that uh, here, interestingly, only complete tooth loss have uh, showed a significant rate of uh, cognitive decline in compared to neither ones. 
But for the oldest old, these are all not significant anim anymore in terms of the rate of decline. So here that our find, and this is basically kind of more visual uh, the, uh, demonstration, vis visualize the results for uh, young old young older group that is 65 to uh, uh, 74. And that this is the, the 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 rate of decline overall right for uh, 10 years. Then you look at those both conditions, they have more rapid decline. But here is a complete two thrust one, the blue solid uh, line is for those uh, last uh, all their teeth. But this is a dotted line, like a greenish dotted line is for diabetes. And this is for without any of these conditions. Again, their, their cognitive decline rate is um, much uh, uh, slower. But if you look at those individuals at the middle age, middle old, uh, old adults, this is uh, uh, that for those individuals have a complete tooth loss. Uh, this is the line here, the solid line, a blue line that shows they have a more significant rate of cognitive uh, impair, uh, impairment, cognitive function, so more uh, rate of uh, a decline, as I showed in the in the table. So this is pretty kind of con this is just a visualization of the findings here. So. Um, that overall, the summary of the findings for the young old that we found that the co-occurrence of diabetes and edentulism was not only associated with cognitive function, but also with an accelerated rate of cognitive decline over time. And the diabetes only led to an accelerated rate of cognitive decline. But this is only for young old uh, age group. Edentrism increased the rate of decline among the young old as well as the middle old. But we did not find the, the findings, significant findings among the oldest old. So it clearly shows some age differences, which is different from previous uh, 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 the findings that previous literature, they did not particularly look at all these, how this oldest old age group versus young old. And they look at the kind of, uh, uh, for all the adults put into kind of one, one categories, but but we did not find that this is all the old um, groups this is an interesting one. So here that most study demonstrate all the adults with diabetes had the worst cognitive function. But so uh, there are a few studies show that although um, diabetes is not always linked with an accelerated rate of cognitive uh, decline, especially for the oldest old. But we that uh, previous study have never shown any kind of a study being conducted look at oral health impact like across different age groups in older adults. So that is the this the the the, the findings that show that the manifestations and the pro prognosis could vary across age group in older adults especially when the brain undergoes the structure and the neurodegenerative kind of changes. Certainly also can be some survival if, uh, effect. When you look at longitudinal studies, uh, many older adults who have a poor uh, diabetes, who have a poor condition of diabetes and poor, poor oral health may actually already kind of uh, uh, passed away and they were not able to kind of stay in, uh, in this kind of, in, in, uh, survived into oldest old age. So this is can be, uh, when you're dealing with longitudinal study, this is one potential problem. So, so despite the, the, the growing body of literature exploring the relationship between oral health and cognitive decline, most of them only focus on these um, 65 to 84 uh, age groups. So oldest to old, this is uh, have them. Uh, previously did not have uh, any uh, study have particular look into the oldest to old. So several recent studies found no association between cognitive impairment and tooth loss among older adults aged 75 and, and even uh, uh, centenarian. So overall that, uh, that uh, oral health and brain aging, what we know what we know is that some evidence suggests the association between oral health and the brain uh, aging. There's some uh, uh, associations has been found. 
uh, from the most studies, including systematic review and meta-analysis. But most of these findings are based on epidemiological studies, observational studies, and uh, most studies rely on self-reported data in terms of uh, uh, their uh, uh, oral health conditions, or this is a self-reported tooth loss, or complete tooth loss or number of um, uh, uh, teeth uh, lost. So these are all kind of uh, what we know based on these kind of findings. But we don't know is how does the changes in oral health in relationship to changes in cognitive function. We are struggling with uh, the limited data sets that we have, that there's no um, uh, particularly good data sets that can uh, capture into all these informations in terms of changes in oral health. And also that uh, we uh, lack of uh, clinical examinations of uh, oral health uh, data. So it's hard to find the data set that with both uh, data in terms of uh, changes in uh, oral health from clinical examinations or change of uh, 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 information cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment actually has more, there's many, many uh, studies we know have the longitudinally look at the cognitive impairment, changes of cognitive impairment. But combine both, include both is very, very few studies, even internationally, that's a lack of data on that. So, uh, certainly lack of uh, uh, clinical trials to test the causal relationships. So every time uh, when I present findings, I'm trying to be very careful, look at all these findings association that is not causal a relationship. So there's a, a lack of uh, uh, chronic, uh, uh, clinical trials to test the causal relationships between oral health and, uh, and the brain aging. This is something that we we need to do for future studies. This is also something that I want to, it's a natural segue to the, my kind of next set of uh, presentation I want to uh, discuss uh, with you in terms of uh, our ongoing studies. Look at uh, the funded by NIH, look at the care partner assisted intervention to improve our health of individuals with, with mild dementia. We are currently in the recruitment phase that uh, look at uh, uh, trying to recruit uh, individuals with uh, uh, mild dementia. Uh, and uh, for those, we also uh, identify these uh, caregivers that currently are providing care for those individuals. These are our eligible participants there. So we uh, overall that we are looking at uh, uh, this study description is our design includes three groups. One is control groups. This group receives an educational booklet only and the continuous uh, usual brushing techniques. Then also there's a, one treatment group is receiving educational booklet as well as a smart electronic toothbrush. The reason that in our uh, intervention to include the smart uh, electronic toothbrush is that uh, this brush can record oral hygiene behavior instead of just relying on self-reported uh, uh, oral hygiene behavior. We know that uh, for those individuals that the validity and accuracy of the self-reported information uh, can be compromised. So using this as a smart electronic toothbrush can record the brushing behaviors. Then treatment group two, which is really our intervention kind of uh, uh, is about, is uh, receive education booklet, smart uh, electronic toothbrush, as well as the tailored the care plan and the coaching. So we work with, we coach uh, caregivers, their caregivers, as well as persons with uh, dementia, how to develop this kind of care plan and establish care patterns in terms of uh, uh, help them oral hygiene, not only helping them oral hygiene, but also how at this early stage of dementia, there's many things that are rapidly changing and the, the persons with dementia, uh, both, both the caregivers can be confused, can be very frustrated and think about how to kind of handle in this kind of daily challenges. In this sense that our uh, interventionists are all well-trained dementia experts, <clears throat> They provide uh, training 
to uh, these uh, uh, caregivers in terms of how to improve their communication uh, skills, as well as how to kind of uh, help the, the, the train uh, individuals to handle daily, uh, daily tasks, da daily uh, struggles. So this is actually for caregiving training, this is way beyond, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> our health as a, a study outcomes. And so we also measure communication, individuals and dietic communications, as well as, uh, as a, a kind of a, a daily, uh, that how to handle a daily uh, 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 stresses. So this uh, is a three months uh, in-home, uh, three in-home visits. We have our dental hygienist as well as um, as uh, interventionist. It depends on which group this uh, participant will, uh, will be interventionist uh, for this three months uh, and have uh, phone calls, uh, provide the family counselings uh, to the individuals. So uh, that's uh, and the three months maintenance. Once we have. Uh, three, inter uh, three months interactive kind of intervention and the three months maintenance phase. So uh, overall three uh, 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 home visits as well as three additional uh, telephone counseling uh, sessions to persons with dementia and their caregivers. So discuss this, how, how they are doing, how they kind of, what are the challenges they face all these and provide a lot of uh, educational kind of uh, counseling as well. So there's some findings from our pilot studies that we found it's interesting that uh, this uh, like, uh, uh, we help individuals developing kind of queuing strategies, even like uh, um, uh, uh, help them uh, remember these kind of daily tasks they need to do, uh, how to kind of provide maybe visual queuing or talk uh, and look at more focused communication, how we can improve the communication skills and establish this kind of smart goals, like one step at a time to help them achieve what they need to achieve. And the self uh, reflection on kind of a, a second ordering kind of learning, learning techniques to train uh, caregivers to do that. So, um, we have uh, both using both qualitative and quantitative kind of methods to uh, collect information that uh, for dent dental hygienists, uh, the, the uh, uh, clinical evaluation of the oral hygiene over three or six months period. And also we have interviews with the caregivers and the um, uh, persons with dementia to talk about uh, how their feedback towards in uh, interventions. So, Qualitative summaries, uh, quantitative summaries, the oral health of the participants in both treatment group one and the treatment group two, that means give them electronic to kind of to, a smart toothbrush that improve the oral health uh, improved. And the but treatment group two, which is our caregiver uh, pattern enhanced intervention showed a slightly uh, greater in, uh, uh, improvement. But for our, uh, for our pilot study, we also included the MCI group. But for our current ongoing studies, we only focus on persons with, uh, with mild dementia. So that uh, improves uh, a lot in, in that sense. Um, so uh, for challenges, participants will call reported challenges in the oral hygiene techniques and report learning with care partners. So the whole notion of learning together uh, for care partners as well as for those individuals with dementia. It's a concept of kind of provide support to, you, to each other, learning together kind of concept. So care partners gain insight into their own behaviors. So again, that what I want to emphasize here is just to think about oral hygiene. It's just one part of outcomes. It is really when we conduct, deliver these kind of interventions, care, care partners understand and has gained a lot of insight into their caregiving overall kind of behaviors, how to provide more efficient and kind of a care um, pattern, learn to use communication techniques um, uh, is also a big kind of a task for them to do. Um, then uh, think about uh, that uh, the visual cueing uh, were most frequently mentioned 
and particularly thinking about standing together by mirror to brush and place cures on counters of mirrors. So these are kind of strategies coming out of the kind of a discussion, uh, this uh, uh, qualitative uh, findings. And establishing a routine around oral care helps. This is also from this uh, uh, pilot. Um, that overall the participants in this study showed improved oral hygiene upon the completion of the study. And the pilot data shows some promising results in improving oral hygiene among community joining older adults with cognitive impairment. Uh, these, and that uh, once we enroll these participants, overall we have uh, only uh, one person, uh, one diet uh, uh, did not have a follow up, did not complete the whole study out of 25 diets. So you can see this uh, the uh, retention rate is very, very high. And people um, really like uh, these kind of interventions. And one caregivers, just recently we have this, uh, uh, that the ongoing study, one caregivers uh, said to our uh, study team, say, wow, this intervention changed my life. So this is, again, this kind of uh, clinical uh, interventions is very interesting, but also very time consuming. So again, this is, uh, I would like to acknowledge the funding agency's uh, um, support to our uh, project over the past, uh, um, past five years of work and, and also the ongoing uh, work that we uh, are having. So uh, I want to uh, stop sharing here. This is the end of my uh, presentation. And uh, I would like to have your uh, uh, questions.